Support for Starting Small comes from Human Scale, the leading designer and manufacturer of high-performance ergonomic products that help create a healthier work life. All of the products from chairs to standing desk and more are comfortable, easy to use, and sustainable, and great for either the office or the work from home environment. With an increase in shifting workplaces, comfort can be especially hard to find. As I run the podcast, I'm in front of my desk for hours a day, from scheduling, researching, interviewing, and more. Human Scale allows me to remain productive without the consequence of body stress to follow. Make sure to check out Human Scale at humanscale.com and use code starting small at checkout to save 20% off your purchase. That's code starting small at humanscale.com and enjoy the episode. Hello, and thank you for tuning in to Starting Small, a podcast about brand development, entrepreneurship, and innovation in the modern world. In this episode, I'm joined by John Richards, founder of Nomadic, minimalistic gear with a strong focus on functionality. John and his cousin Jacob designed an innovative wallet and launched it on Kickstarter. They expected to get about 50 orders, but over 6,000 people backed their campaign. Since then, they have launched multiple crowdfunding campaigns and shipped product to hundreds of thousands of people across the globe. Hello, and thank you for tuning in to Starting Small. Today, I'm joined by John Richards of Nomadic. John, thank you so much for joining me today. Thanks for having me, Cameron. Of course. So I want to start out with your upbringing. So where did you grow up and what was your childhood like? So I grew up in Salt Lake City, Utah. Um, I spent the first 13 years of my life um, there right by the University of Utah. A great neighborhood. Um, and then kind of got pulled out of um, my group of friends and, and junior high. And my parents moved me to St. Louis, Missouri with them. So hmm. lived in St. Louis, Missouri for three years. Um, totally different experience than Salt Lake City, but super yeah. valuable and and uh, loved every minute of it. And then Moved back actually to the same home, um, finished high school um, at East High and in Salt Lake, and um, so yeah, that's kind of my that was kind of like my upbringing and where I'm from. Nice. Would you say you had an entrepreneurship mindset growing up, say lemonade stands or selling products? Totally. Yeah. I um. So when I just had returned from St. Louis, I started a, a garbage can cleaning company where I'd go door to door on garbage day. And after they'd empty the, the garbage cans, I'd charge $20 a can to clean them out for people. Wow. Um, and that's kind of how I made my wages in, in high school and, and, uh, paid for, uh, college and some humanitarian trips that way. Amazing. I saw that you were in boy Scouts. Is that correct? Yep. Um, if you could explain how that experience, I saw that you achieved your Eagle Scout, how that has shaped your work ethic today. You know, a bit in a big way, like that was, that was for me more an experience of learning to um, collaborate with my peers and, and people my same age. And, I, you know, whether you're camping or hiking or whatever it may be, there was multiple times where I was put in situations where I had to learn to kind of um, communicate and collaborate in those ways. And so more than tying knots and learning how to camp in the snow, like it, for me, it just taught me how to um, like build that team and that, um, I guess, group of friends that, that I've kind of stayed with throughout the years. Awesome. I saw you went on to BYU in 2006. What did you study there? So I did a business uh, management, had an emphasis in entrepreneurship. At the time, entrepreneurship wasn't um, a major and now it is, um, but loved every minute of that, those classes. Um, and yeah, so just the merit school was kind of my my thing. Yeah. Were you involved with any athletics or clubs? Uh, in college, I didn't do any athletics. I kind of just, I mean, I took some tennis classes and um, some, some things like that, but never, never professionally played uh, in college. Um, as far as clubs, I was, you know, a member of the BYU Finance Society and um, a couple other things, but more, more than that, it was just like, my jobs on the side were kind of like where I was finding my passion. And so I uh, worked for an apartment complex and learned the ins and outs of property management, which honestly kind of kickstarted my desire to, to do some re real estate investing myself and, and to be able to manage the property myself. Got it. Following graduation and prior to nomadic then what kind of jobs were you working? Were you still in real estate continuing on? So I took a job out of college with, uh, H HR software company. Okay. So we were doing HR sales. Uh, I was doing 
you know, just phone calls, a hundred calls a day, just trying to, uh, hit my quota. And as much as I love that company, it was called Bamboo HR. Definitely like love the culture, love the company, but the job itself and the grind was not for me. And I just, I just felt kind of lost there. And at, at the same time was building um, nomadic on the side. And it was just more of a side hustle. You know, I'd work my 40 hour sales job, but then probably putting in another 20 hours of just a uh, hustle to say, let's get this, you know, product launch on Kickstarter and kind of start this brand. And so that's where, that's kind of where it all started. I worked at that job for eight months and then they were nice enough to, they, they, they saw the success of that company and they kind of pushed me out the door and said, look, go live your dream and um, we'll pay you a month's salary to, to help you like get this, to get this company off the ground. And that was the best thing that yeah. ever happened. Around what time was that? That was December of 2014. Okay. So you ended up starting Nomadic with your cousin, Jacob. What inspired you both to start a company together? So we were just, um, we, he actually invited me to a jazz game. We were just sitting in the stands and it was like, it, it was just a topic of conversation is that we always discussed is business and like, you know, could we make some money buying some vending machines or starting some other random uh, business idea. And so we were always spinning things around. Um, but this time I mentioned Kickstarter to him and he kind of caught hold on that idea, did some research and found that wallets performed really well on Kickstarter. And so that's our first product that we started with was just a minimalist wallet that helped people carry exactly what they needed and nothing more. And it, it took us by surprise how quickly it took off. I think a lot of people really love the idea. And so that's what kind of kickstarted the company and got it all going. But it just started from conversations of how can we make an extra buck? How can we learn to leverage social media to kind of grow, grow this, this idea that we have. So with the wallet at the initial start, what did the prototyping process look like? Were you guys personally engineering the product? Yeah, it was, it was totally scrappy. I mean, imagine Jacob, he's never sewn in his life and his eight year old um, niece is teaching him how to sew on a, on his mother-in-law's <laughs> sewing machine in his basement. And so I would, I, we would brainstorm ideas and we kind of came up with this idea, this pull tab that kind of would go through your cards and it would allow you to pull out your cards and easily eject the ones you would want. And um, Jacob just started prototyping, sewing things in his basement. And I even sewed a couple by hand at my house. And so it was just, we'd go to the local like fabric shop, buy some materials, and then we'd just prototype and send our ideas back and forth on video. And um, you know, Jacob busted out 10, 20 different prototypes on that sewing machine. And we finally got it to a one where people were just really loving it and were excited. So it was totally bootstrapped. You know, the, the, as far as the company goes, we put around $200. It was our initial investment into this company. So wow. it's, it's kind of one of those, it's one of those success stories. I think that's maybe unrealistic to, to think <laughs> that you can pull it off, but we, we were one of those ones who were able to do it just because we've leveraged Kickstarter um, with each of our product launches. It's allowed us to bootstrap the business without any outside funding or giving up equity. For sure. When you first launched on Kickstarter, were you guys trying to raise a certain amount then? Yeah, we were shooting for $10,000. Um, that okay. was kind of like our goal. And we were on pace. We had done $5,000 in about the first week. And, you know, on pace to probably hit that 10 by the end, but it wouldn't have been anything crazy. It just would have barely hit our goal. And so, you know, we were, we were excited about that, honestly, we couldn't believe it. And then we came across some guys that knew Facebook advertising really well. And they said, Hey, let us take a stab at, at, um, at doing Facebook ads on your, on your campaign. And we did, and we were getting crazy good returns. Um, immediately we were starting to do, doing about $5,000 a day in funding for the last I think 15 days of the campaign. Wow. So they raised $150,000 in like a two week period. And so we ended up at about 170 total in funding. And for us, like having this goal of 10,000 and hitting 170 was, it was life changing because it allowed us to really just get this business started. We had enough capital after that campaign to buy a big purchase order and really have inventory to, to scale and pay some designers and developers to get it going. And so that, that in a big way really just got us to where we are. I hope you guys are enjoying this episode so far around John's entrepreneurial journey. I'd like to pause and say thank you to this episode's mid-break sponsor, Yida Home. Yida Home's online store dedicates to providing fashionable and practical home furniture at a very low cost. Whether it's furniture for your bedroom, office, or living room, 
Yida Home provides an array of products. Make sure to check out this episode's description and use code 25 Yida Home to save 25% off your purchase and enjoy the rest of the episode. With that initial big boost, how are you keeping up with production? Just the two of you. So we didn't sew them ourselves. I should say we sewed all the prototypes and okay, just okay. to get it. But we sourced the factory overseas in China. My business partner had about five years of experience sourcing products overseas. We found a good factory we liked working with. We actually even flew out there. Um, met, uh, post the campaign, we flew out there, met with them, and loved the the factory. But it it became um, it quickly apparent that we weren't going to be able to make thirteen thousand wallets on our own. Like yeah. my sister offered to sell them originally, and we're like, oh yeah, we'll sell three hundred or four hundred. <laughs> But when we had 13,000, we're like, this would take you six years to sell this all. This all. <laughs> <laughs> That's amazing. So at this time, did you guys have an official website or was it just a Kickstarter company at this point? You know, it's funny. We actually started with the name basicsproducts.com and that was our original website. The, ba- the wallet we called the basics wallet. Our whole brand and identity was based around this minimalist idea of going back to the basics. So the company was basics products, but quickly we got some uh, trademark um, suits and things that started hitting our inboxes saying, Hey, you're, you're uh, infringing on our trademark because the word basics has been trademarked over 1600 times. And we were, we were unaware. I mean, just naive business people going into this. So we started looking for names that we could own the domain that we could change and shift away from basics and make it something a little bit more vision focused. And so we were just about to launch a travel bag, we, we, we searched for some domains that, that we felt could work really well. And we just kind of stuck on Nomadic. We really loved that name. And so about two years into the business, we transitioned the name to Nomadic. And it was a big shift for us. I mean, super scary at the time, but it's ended up being one of the best things we've ever done. Is there a specific inspiration uh, for the name Nomadic? I mean, um, the, as far as how we found it and how we came up with it, there's no like aha moment um that that some super exciting story but it was more just calculated it was hey let's do a trademark search let's see what exists you know there were zero trademarks on the name nomadic in the u.s um and then you know there was the next step of we want to own the domain so we found a seven letter or less domains that we could actually own the entire domain and and that's another factor that went into that decision and then also just the name and the feel and the vibe and you know, we knew we were kind of going to that travel space and mm-hmm. the whole idea of a nomad just, it just felt right. And it just felt like it was the right thing to do. We mocked up a logo that we really loved and it's just stuck. And so that's, you know, there's no big inspiration behind it. I think it was just more calculated to say, can this be a brand we can scale into the future? Got it. At what point did you decide to expand Nomadic further than the wallet? Um you know, after the campaign was over with the wallet, we had about $60,000 of profit from that campaign, which was significant. I mean, yeah. we were sitting there as, you know, I had been making $39,000 at my sales job a year before that. So I'm sitting there looking at the 60000 in our bank account and saying, Jacob, I can make this work. Let me, let me quit my job and start doing this full time. And um, he kind of was scared at first, but he's like, John, if you want to do it, like, let's make it happen. Mm-hmm. Um, and so I jumped out of my job, uh, learned how to do Facebook advertising and was able to leverage that cash we had in the bank to really scale it. And, you know, it just came down to that decision. It was, do we split this 50, 50 and each be 30 grand richer, or do we turn this into a real business and try to make this happen? And, you know, I think because I was willing to jump out of my job, it allowed Jacob to have a little more flexibility. He had at the time had a couple of kids in a house. And so mm-hmm. he was a little more weary of maybe leaving his full-time thing. And so, I was a little bit more flexible, moved in with the in-laws and paid myself a thousand dollars a month to just bootstrap the business. And I think it's, it's paid huge dividends. Um, and I'm just super grateful. I was able to do that. Absolutely. Currently with a wide variety of bags, accessories, um, what would you say is the top seller for nomadic today? So as far as number of units sold our travel backpack, it's called the travel pack. Okay. That one outsells our other bags. Um, it's it's definitely the best because it's a small bag that can be used for every day, but it also has significant expansion that can be used for a two to three day trip. So a lot of people love that bag because of its versatility. It's totally water resistant, super durable, tons of pockets. Um, so that bag is our number one seller by far. But I will say our um, new camera line that we launched with Peter McKinnon, 
is quickly um, overtaking that bag in popularity and in volume. Um, uh, it, it's it's potentially outselling the travel pack right now, especially during COVID with le less people traveling. We've been selling a lot more of those camera bags. Got it. What would you say is the main demographic overall then? So we definitely um, tend to be more heavy on the male side. We're about 80 male, 80% 80 male, 20% female. Mm -hmm. And um, our customers are in the range of about 35 years old to 45. They typically are um, managers, um, they're, you know, C-level executives, or they, they usually have a, a, maybe a higher title at their company. They're, they're usually business professionals that get paid over, you know, $90,000, $100,000 a year type jobs. Um, so that's kind of more, our, our bags are a little more on the high end. So we don't appeal to like, you know, the younger demographic and we don't, we don't yeah. appeal to the, um, it's, it's just a more expensive purchase. So it's more calculated or some people will have discretionary income that they can just kind of use. And that's, uh, you know, I would say as far as the person, it's more of a, it's kind of like a techie dad, I would describe it. <laughs> it, it it's basically me. It's someone yeah. that's got a couple kids that loves technology, loves function, loves organization. And they're all about having quality gear. And that that's the typical customer. And they're, they're usually passionate about something, whether it's, flying drones or F1 racing, or um, just, it doesn't matter what it is. They usually have some passion in their life that they're pursuing. Mm. So to the listeners out there, I was actually with a friend. This is where I first heard about Nomadic uh, two years ago. And I saw your backpack and she began opening up all the compartments, pulling out different like levers. And I could not believe how functional and extendable the bag truly was i've never seen anything like it so i just wanted to mention that as well um it's really remarkable what you guys have created with just the functionality and like efficiency behind that bag thank you yeah that's nice of you i think it's been um it's been interesting because neither me or my business partner are bag designers but we designed all those original bags ourselves and i think that allowed us to kind of break down the barriers that exist in the market to say here's what's typical for a backpack and here's what's typical for a travel bag. And we just said, look, I don't care about any of that. I just want it to be the most functional bag ever. So we're willing to try crazy things like putting zippers inside of zippers and things that normal yeah. bag manufacturers wouldn't do. And it's allowed us to create really functional products. Amazing. Bouncing off of that, then what would you say overall separates Nomadic from your competitors? Yeah, it's definitely the function piece. Um, we, we focus on just having kind of a wow factor with each of our bags that you've never seen before, but it's something that adds a ton of value. And, you know, we focus, we focus heavily on sourcing really high quality materials or cra the craftsmanship is amazing. It's all, we just focus on having a high end look and feel in the brand. And I think when you look at some of the competitors bags, they may be half the cost or, it may just be like, you know, a to me or something that's the same cost or more expensive, but has less function. And so we kind of are in that sweet spot where it's the perfect balance between uh, function and fast fashion, but it's not, it's not a designer price, but it's also not like your Amazon basics yeah. line that you just use for three months and the strap breaks on you. For sure. Can Nomadic currently be found in any retail or are you guys hundred percent e-commerce? So we're just starting to get into retail. Our main retail right now is Best Buy. Um, we've got some of our, our bags there and bestbuy.com we saw online as well. Um, but we're just starting to get into kind of the photo space, uh, B&H Photo, a couple other photography um, companies are picking it up because they love the, the camera gear. Mm -hmm. um, so retail honestly has, been a, has not really been a focus. We've tried to just say, let's build the online presence. Let's build the e-commerce brand first. And then we kind of plan to approach retail. And so this year is like the first year we're making a real emphasis into that space. And I, I suspect we'll be um, seeing some significant growth in that category. Awesome. Well, I like to conclude each episode with this. If you could share one piece of advice with an aspiring entrepreneur, maybe something you've learned or regret, what would that be? Something I've learned that I think a lot of entrepreneurs hear this over and over. And I think a lot of people that want to kind of start their own thing that I think the biggest thing is just, um, I think a lot of people get caught up in this analysis paralysis of just trying to figure out what's, 
what's the right product? How do I, you know, I want to be an entrepreneur. I want to start my own thing, but I just don't know how to do it. And I think for me, the biggest thing was just um, taking that step and, and defining what, what it is I wanted to do and then just making it happen. I think that's a lot, a lot of people are just worried to get started. And I would say rather than worrying about your domain or the name or the logo, like don't worry about any of that stuff. Just, you know, start, start small like we did with just a wallet you know we, we we didn't get the name right the first time we didn't even get the wallet right the first time in fact 10 percent or more of the wallets we shipped out started fraying almost immediately and this was a huge headache that we had to fix but the point is we were able to bounce back from that and we never would have learned and grown had we not just taken that first step to get there and so i just say like don't be afraid to just get going and you don't have to quit your job and and leave everything behind you can you can be you can work on the side and just start start testing things start trying and just get going and, and stop deliberating over the little details and just say i'm going to do this and just make it happen and and i think that's the biggest thing is you know i look back and i say i'm not a i'm not a marketer i didn't learn facebook advertising in, in college mm -hmm. but after an hour sitting down with someone that knew what they were doing i was able to get dangerously competitive at facebook ads where i drove almost $2 million in sales that first year of business through just a wallet and Facebook advertising. So mm -hmm. I'm not saying that I'm a pro by any means and I'm not, I'm not even the smartest guy in the room, but I think I'm, I'm one of those guys that say I'm willing to just dive in and make this happen. And I think that's what it takes to, to be an entrepreneur. And I just say like, that's my advice is just get started. For sure. Well, John, thank you so much for joining me and to the listeners out there, make sure to check out nomadic at nomadic.com. Thank you. Hey, thank you for listening to this episode of Starting Small. If you would, leave a review on whatever platform you're listening on. Also, follow Starting Small Pod on social platforms to keep up to date on future guests.